stand and uh, I want to do something a little different tonight. That's okay. Yeah. All right. Can you me? Like some more drums. Some more drums. And a little something to go with that. I feel a lot of hunger in the room tonight. I feel a lot of hunger in my own soul. I, all my life, I've never been maybe the smartest or the, the fastest or the strongest. I've maybe been limited by those things at times. But I'm hungry for God, and that's carried me a very, very long way in my life. It's opened a lot of doors for me. It's, it's brought a lot of things into my life I maybe would not have had otherwise. But, but I feel a deep hunger in the room tonight. It's like I can see that there is a cloud overhead uh, of the Lord that wants to break open. And it's like down below I see hungry ground full of good seed that will receive the rain and produce a harvest. But I think that right now we need to have a moment where maybe those two things come together. Uh, if we could just start playing that a little bit in the background and set the atmosphere. Just give us a little something. And then just if everybody could just maybe just stand to your feet. Amen. We're going to go after God for just a couple of minutes. I've got a, a message I want to bring tonight that the Lord put on my heart. I, I've been weeping over all day. But I think right now we just need to go after God a little bit. What I'd like you to do, if you're, if you're Pentecostal, if you're spirit-filled right now, uh, I hope you are because we don't have time to be anything else right now. But if you're spirit-filled, I want you to begin to pray by the power of the Spirit. I want you to begin to pray in tongues. I want you to let it come out of you. I want you to look at Jesus. If you're not, I just want you to close your eyes. I want you just to begin to say, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I want you to meditate on his name for just a minute. And I want you to give everything you have in the next five minutes and not hold anything back. And I just want you to begin to go after God right now. Lord, we're hungry. Lord, we're hungry. We're hungry. We want more of you. We want more of you. We're not willing to settle for anything less. We want the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We want it in our hearts. We want it in our homes. We want it in our families. We want it in our lives. We want it in this church. We want it in this community. We want it in this area, in this region, God. We want your Holy Spirit, Lord. We want your Holy Spirit, Lord. the year of the Lord. He's coming in power. He's coming by the power of his spirit. He's going to come in miracles. He's going to come and bring in a harvest. But we've got to go after him. Prophetic words are not automatic. We have a response. We have to respond to his word. And we have to follow in the steps of that. And we will see him come to pass. In just a moment, I'm going to count to three. And when we hit three, I want everyone under the sound of my voice to cry out the best hallelujah that you've got inside of you. We're going to lift the hallelujah. Russ, Texas, forgot what it means to have a spirit-filled church. We're about to remind them. We're about to wake them up. And then in, on the count of three, we're going to cry out hallelujah. And you're going to feel the spirit of God rise up in you. And it's going to fill this place. One. Chains are going to break off when you cry out. Two. The spirit's going to come and he's going to move. He's going to fill you. You've been waiting for a touch. You've been waiting for a refreshing. That's right now. Are you ready? Three. Hallelujah. 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 We lift you up, Jesus. We lift you up, Jesus. We lift you up, Jesus. We want more of you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is an incredible honor of mine to stand in this house. Uh, I take the watch night service very seriously because I believe that uh, it's setting a stone in place for the next coming year. And I, I don't know about you, I, I don't know how many years that we might have left. And because of that, I, I don't feel we have the luxury to take any of them for granted. And so I feel that how we start the year 
what we proclaim over our year and then what we walk in in the rest of that year, I feel like it will determine everything else. Everything else will be a reflection of that. Everything else will be an offshoot of that. And so if we're going to start, we better start right. I know that in the past years, we've heard a lot of noise. We've heard a lot of words about what the year was going to be. If we listen to everything that we heard in 2020, it was going to be a year of clear vision and Trump would be president. We all know maybe that didn't work out so well. We won't talk about that tonight because I like coming back here. But, but you know, I looked around and, you know, in, in China they have this revolving calendar. It's the year of the dog. It's the year of the rat. You, you would think maybe they could pick some better role models. But they have these different things that they rotate around. And, uh, and I'm not throwing a stone. I'm just saying it's an interesting concept. Here we have, you know, uh, they, they have the... Uh, astrology calendar where you're a, you're a Leo or a Libra or all this other nonsense and witchcraft. You know, you have all these things that they rotate through, you know, and then in the church, we have kind of this thing we do where, you know, somebody gets maybe a word from somewhere. Maybe it's from God, maybe it's not, but then it begins to spread and it's, it's the year of this. Uh, a few years back, it was the year the camels are coming and then it was something else and it was something else and it was something else. And every year it's like we have this, this new thing and we're not that much different. We want some exciting thing to say, this is the year of this this year and it's usually prosperity and it's usually all these things that, that sound very good and they'll get a lot of amens. They'll get a lot of hallelujahs. But where did it originate? See, right now, I don't know what the prophets are going to maybe say this year. I don't know what's going to come out. But I know for me, I know as I sought the Lord today, I know as I was on my face, I know as I began to weep over this service and over this church and over this community, I know one thing came up in my heart again and again and again. Can 2022 be the year of Jesus? Can it be a year where we cut everything else out? Every other ambition. And it's just the year of Jesus. We're start to finish. He is the sole focus. He is all that we're chasing after. He is all that we want and need. Let 2022 be the year. Every day we sit alone and we look at Jesus. May this be his year in our hearts, in our lives. That's what I believe he would like. I have a scripture today we're going to use. We're going to go into Matthew 6.33. Matthew 6.33. I feel like if we're going to focus on Jesus, we need to probably spend more time reading some things that he said. Uh, I think it's too easy to uh, get really excited about things and then not really, you know, give them any substance or give them any uh, weight or any merit. You know, it's very easy to say this is going to be the year of, of Jesus or the year of this thing or the year of great revival. Uh, but then there are like things you have to do to walk that out and actually see that come to pass. It doesn't happen. I see people all the time. They will say things to me like, uh, you know, I heard a word when I was a child that said I was going to be a prophet to the nation. And they kind of say that, they kind of stand back for a second. They sort of expect you to be like, oh, I did not know I was in the presence of a prophet. But it's like they haven't done anything for God. They just, I mean, they're maybe a good person. But those words, those prophecies, they're not automatic. And to think that they are, I don't believe that's biblical because I try to read my Bible. I may not be the smartest man in the world, but when I read the Bible, there are some things I see again and again and again. I see where he says, if and then, if and then, if you will walk in my ways, I will bless you. If you walk away from me, there will be a curse. These things are very simple to me, and yet they seem to have been missed by people much smarter than me. And I don't understand what that is. It's not faith. It's wishful thinking. Because there's, when there's a prophetic word that comes forth on your life, there's an aspect where you have to say, yes, Lord, I'll go. You then have to step out and go. And when you got there, you can say this word was a true word because I saw it come to pass. We don't get to stay back over here and say, I know where I'm going because, you know, I got this word when I was 15 and I'm 50. But man, it's coming. I know one of these days, uh, you know, Benny Hinn's going to call me. You know, Daniel Glenn is going to call me and I'm going to be a famous evangelist. It's not going to happen. You've got to do the work God puts before you. You've got to obey the steps he puts before you and take those day by day. But what does that have to do with Matthew 6.33? Let's find out. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. 
and all these things shall be added unto you. I, I want to really break that down. I, I think probably most of you know the Lord in here. I I'm going to hope that most of my Harvest House guys are doing real good right now. I think that they are. And we'll have a time where we spend with Jesus in just a few minutes where we're going to come and let him begin to strip some things out of us. But I want to break this scripture down because I believe that if we're truly going to see this come to pass in our personal lives, in our ministries, in our families, in this church, and in this, this community and this region where I think God is beginning to stir things and move and things are about to break out, then I think we better get a hold of what this really means. So point number one, seek first the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom. You see, it's his kingdom. It's his kingdom. Some of us spend our whole entire lives building our own kingdoms. It's a kingdom built on sand. It's a kingdom that chases after material possessions. It's a kingdom built on fame and fortune. It's a kingdom built on reputation. It's a kingdom maybe even built on good standing in the community. But it's not the kingdom of God. It's not his kingdom. Because when we come to build his kingdom, we have to lay all of that down. And we have to say, I don't need that. I don't need that. I just want to build God's kingdom. We have to be, build his kingdom. That's an intentional thing. What does that look like? That's not an accident. It looks like something. Building the kingdom of God, it looks like something. It, it looks like going out and sharing your faith with people. It looks like going out and allowing others to come in and have encounters with Jesus. I, I tell everybody I've ever had the opportunity to, to speak into their life, you must have a devotional life. You must have time alone with God in the morning. You must have a fresh encounter. Too many people, they spend their whole lives and they're, they, they're talking about the encounter they had at Brownsville or the encounter they had at this particular spot or this particular day. And they had a mighty moment there where God moved and that's real and that's valid. But why didn't it happen again? Why did it stop there? Why was that special service? Why was that particular night the last time you went after God like that? Maybe nobody ever told you you could have it, but man, God wants to meet with you every day. You can have an encounter with Jesus every day. I wouldn't make it maybe two or three days even still living holy if I didn't have an encounter with Jesus every day. I need him. I need him more than you do. I need him every moment. I need him every second. I need him every day. I learned a long time ago, I have nothing to give to the world outside of what Jesus puts in me. And by the end of the day, whatever he put in that morning, it's usually spit. It's all I had. And so the next day, I've got to go after God again. And I've got to get a hold of heaven again and let him get a hold of me. And then when he does, I have something to give. But if there's no Jesus, there's no me. I have nothing. I have nothing to offer. And so if I'm going to build God's kingdom, I, I probably need God to do that. And so I've got to get alone with him. I've got to let him fill me up. And then I've got to let him speak through me, live through me, and move through me. If, if I don't do that, it's just worthless. Everybody say worthless. 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 I don't want to live a worthless life. I want to stand before God one day and I want it to mean something. So we're, we're building his kingdom. And it's a kingdom of God. See, sometimes I feel like I feel like there's a disconnect between like Christianity, the thing. And then like Jesus, the person. I feel like Christianity can become a, a social position. We want to do the Christian thing. We want to look Christian. We want to be Christian. And I know a lot of people that are much better at that probably than I am. But sometimes those people, if you really get down in deep, they don't really know how to just get alone with Jesus. They, and I'm not saying they're Pharisees. I'm not saying that's fake. I'm just saying they, they've got this, this thing where they know how to walk it out and look the Christian part. But in their heart, there's not a fire burning with love for Jesus. There's not a passionate romance with the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. There's not a secret place where the fire burns and they're drawn in and they're hungry for more of God. Where throughout the day, they literally miss those alone times with Jesus. You see, there's a difference between having Christianity and being in love with Jesus. He's a person. He's a being. And we've got to go after him. 
I, I grew up my whole life. I had, I had Christianity. That was, that was good. I liked church. But man, when I met Jesus, when he became my best friend, you couldn't talk me out of a person. You could talk me out of a religion. You could talk me out of an argument. You could talk me out of one theology or another. But when I met the king, when he became my best friend, when he wrapped his arms around me and he said, no more, we're going this way. You couldn't talk me out of that. I met him. I met somebody. And it changed everything. If we're going to build the kingdom of God, if we're going to seek that first, probably we have to seek him. We have to know him as the person. You see, being moral, being moral is not the same thing as, as following Jesus. I know plenty of, of Muslims that are moral people. I, I know plenty of Buddhists that are moral people. I know plenty of people that are 110% going to hell atheists that are relatively moral people. Sometimes they're nicer than I am. Sometimes they're in the drive through and, and nothing's going right. And they handle that situation better than I did. But morality is not the scale. Because Isaiah says our, our righteousness is as filthy rags. You, you see, there's an aspect where we can do righteous things. We can do moral things. But God didn't tell us, come and do your absolute best to look as moral and, and clean cut as you can. And maybe nobody will know the dirty secrets that only you and your family knows when the door shuts. He said, come and seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. His righteousness. It belongs to him. We get alone with Jesus and he does something inside of us. When we spend time with the Lord, he cleanses us. He refreshes us, man. He makes us new again. He changes us, Nick. He makes us brand new. He gives us a kind of righteousness. That's a, it's like a supernatural power. It's amen every day. It's not something we're putting on to try to just like to do. It's not something we try to act it's not secular humanism where, man, I, I smoked five cigarettes yesterday. I'm going to do four today. I, I only looked at porn three days this week instead of four. I'm doing a little better. Man, that's going to send you straight to hell. Jesus, his righteousness is, I take all of my sin just as I am. And I come to the king of kings because he took all of his righteousness as he is. He came to this earth. He's born of a virgin. He carried a wooden cross for us. He was beaten for us. He was nailed to that cross for us. He bled out and he died. And he died for your sins and he died for my sins. But he rose from the dead for our justification so we could follow him out of our sin. His righteousness is not, I'm going to try to do a little better. His righteousness is, I died, but I was born again. I'm a new man, and I'm free from the things that used to bind me. I'm a new creature. 2 Corinthians 5.17, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. That's the righteousness of Jesus. Don't let anybody sell you a cheap, watered-down version of that. His, his righteousness is freedom. It's holiness. Leonard Ravenhill used to say, Holiness, holiness is the normal way of life for a believer. Everything less than that is sickness. You know, there's all kind of sickness going around today. There's all kind of symptoms. There's all kind of things to let you know you're sick. But Ravenhill would say, Holiness is the natural way of life for a Christian. For a believer, anything less than that is sickness. It, it doesn't necessarily mean you have a demon. It doesn't mean you need deliverance. You just need to come and repent and get right with God. It's not nearly as complicated. Come to Jesus. He'll set you free. Do you have a demon or don't you? Come to Jesus. He'll set you free. Are you addicted or is it just a bad choice? Come to Jesus. He'll set you free. Amen. His righteousness. Raven Hill would also say, though, usually about the time. Somebody gets up to normal temperature. Everybody thinks he's got a fever. See, we need some Christians to rise up that are going to burn for Jesus. That, that are tired of going to work day in and day out and walking through the square and going about their day being lukewarm, being cold, not, not trying to, you know, uh, let the light burn. We sing that song, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. But, but I see too many lights peeking out from underneath bushels. I see too many little candle lights trying to shine, but, but there's all the fear of what are my friends going to think? What's my boss going to think? What if I get branded as the weird religious person at work? All those things come and, and they, they choke out that light. But I'm not really sure we got the idea about a little light anyway. God called us to burn. 
God is an all-consuming fire. And when you get alone with an all-consuming fire, all those excuses, all of the fears, all of the things that would try to hide that light, it begins to burn away. It begins to burn away. And so we've got to look at Jesus and his holy fire and his righteousness. Because his righteousness is like a flame. His righteousness purifies. I've said this before and maybe you'll find this entertaining. Maybe you won't. But, you know, if somebody came to me, Austin, and they said, Brother John, I learned how to fly. Now, I've heard people come and tell me this before. I used to work at the, the state hospital. But, but people will come to me and, and let's say they say, Brother John, I know how to fly. I've been given the gift of flight. I'm going to be like, whoa, come on, man. Get down with it. And, and I'm going to say, you know what? That's amazing. Let's see you fly. And I'm going to watch. And if they take off like Superman, I'm going to live stream that sucker and I'm going to get rich. <laughs> but if there's no flight, I'm going to think you lied to me. I'm going to think you didn't really receive anything. I'm going to think you're over here posing and pretending and being a fake. You're a no count because you don't really have what you just told me you had. Then I read this Holy Bible where it says we were given righteousness as a free gift. But then, if we've been receiving that gift, shouldn't there be righteousness produced? Shouldn't, shouldn't there be a holy life? Shouldn't there be integrity and character forming rapidly inside of you? Shouldn't there be a sign of life? A sign of his holiness? And that, that's my problem when we, we, we're quick to, to give people assurance. But, but I'm, not, I'm not always so sure. You know, a guy named Lester Summerall, well, he, he literally wrote the book on demons. And I'm not trying to get into a bunch of conversation about demons. It's not my thing. But, you know, he said, all these people, they have this question. They, they ask me, can a Christian have a demon? He said, I would not think that this was such a broad question or an important question if so many people had not asked it. I've never had that question in all my life. He says, but, but brother so-and-so is a saint of God and he's been saved 10 years. He, he can't have a demon, can he? And he would say, man, I, I don't have any reason to know he is a Christian. You tell me he is. But I mean, based on what? How do we even know we're a Christian? How do we even know that we're saved? And, and you know, I, I, growing up in the church culture, and, and there's no shame because I've been the same person. But how many times maybe have you or a loved one that they, they've been, you know, they gave their life to the Lord 10 years ago. But then there's another altar call. And they say, you know, I... I just want to make sure it worked. I just really want to make sure. So I'm going to go down just to, I'm going to say the prayer again, just to really make sure it took. And their whole faith is, is in this prayer. And I'm like, man, if, if when I prayed that prayer, when I gave my life to the Lord, if something didn't change, I wouldn't be sitting here wondering if it worked or not. I would say, man, that wasn't real. And I would have been still going to hell and bound and depressed and alone and, and dying. I wouldn't be here today. But when I met the Lord, something happened inside of me. You know, see, authentic salvation, the authentic born again experience, biblically and every time I've seen it where it really looks like that, something changed. The righteousness of God went into a man. The sin came out of a man. Darkness came out and light came in. There's a, there's a change that happens. They pass from death to life. It, it doesn't happen in 10 seconds. It's something you labor into. It's something you, you sit there with the Lord and wrestle against. You, you don't just like, I'm all for the sinner's prayer. I probably personally led 40 or 50,000 people in a sinner's prayer in the last several months of my life. I'm all about a sinner's prayer. But there better be a Holy Spirit behind it. There better be a real repentance of heart behind it. There better be a real surrender and a real commitment to follow Jesus behind it. Or all they did was repeat a little poem. I had a terrible dream many years ago. Terrible, good, it's hard to really call. And I died in this dream. Which already was strange to me because I read in a book one time that you can't die in a dream. It's impossible. So already I'm a little bit like this is something different. And in this dream, I, I went up to this um, amazing palace in heaven. Almost like this big temple palace kind of thing. And I was in a long line. And it was a very immaculate hallway. Beautiful pillars hewn out of the stone. And there was a little cracked door. And one by one, everyone would step up to the door. They would push it open. It was their turn. 
they would walk inside. On the other side of that door was the throne of God. And he sat there as a holy judge that day. And each person, it was very distinct, each person would step in and they would begin to sing a little song. They would make it a few lines in and then you'd hear the most horrible cry you can ever imagine as they were cast into hell. But I noticed every single one of these people, they had the same little song. And it was almost my turn to go in and I woke up terrified. I fell on my face and I began to go after God in a new way. I began to realize I can't rely on, on something that happened years ago. I can't rely on hoping that I had the right prayer or the right words. I have to rely on, did I hang out with Jesus today? Do I know him today? Do, am I comfortable when I pray, when I spend time with God, when I worship? Am I comfortable that if I die right now, I'm convinced that the person I'm about to go meet, Pastor Keith, is the same one I was just talking to and hearing from right there. That's what it looks like to walk with Jesus. That's what it looks like to follow in him and to build his kingdom and to go after Jesus. Uh, Christianity will settle for, you know, we said the right prayer. But following Jesus won't. It's going to take a little more than a magic set of words you said at an altar. It's a commitment. See, that prayer is a sign of turning. It's a sign of surrender. It's a sign of lordship to the king of kings. It's saying, Jesus, I'm giving my life up to you. I, I had it my way. I had whatever I wanted to do. I had all the sin. I had all of it. It got me nowhere. It got me nothing. All it brought me was pain and destruction, Alex. So I'm giving all that up to you right now. And the rest of my life is yours. It's not magic words. It's obedience to Christ. Additionally, if we want to have a year focused on Jesus, on, on the same theme of, of righteousness and, and kingdoms, something that really concerns me is a lack of understanding of how the light and the dark work. I mean, I, I thought it was really simple. Light is like good. Dark is bad. When you do things of God, they're in the light, they're holy, and they're pure, and they're blessed. When you do things in the dark, they're not. When you do things in the light, it belongs to the Holy Spirit. It's something he can set up on a hill as an example for generations and those around you to follow. When you do things in the dark, you hope that nobody ever sees it. You hope that no one's on the hill watching you because you hope you're getting away with it. But you see, God is light. So he's only in the light. So if you're in the darkness, you walked away from that. And if you're doing something in darkness, if you're hiding things in darkness, uh, you need to understand, do you know who lives in the darkness? There's a very real devil. There's a re very real monster who lives in the darkness. John 10 says he only comes to kill, steal, and destroy. This means if there's darkness in your life to any degree that you're allowing to stay there, there's a process of destruction, thievery, and killing taking place in your life right now. The only way to hit the off switch for that is to fall on your face and cry out to Jesus in repentance. It's not a little bit of me try to do better. It's not the excuses of what if it doesn't work and I've tried before. No, it's to say right now, Jesus, it ends today. I'm taking you at your word. I'm believing you that your righteousness is enough to deliver me out of my sin and out of my darkness. And I'm going after you with all of my heart. If there's darkness, there's a monster. And sometimes we like the little monster when it's small and we can hold it. But there comes a day where that monster is a whole lot bigger than anything we can handle. Some of us in this room tonight, we've seen firsthand the effects of that monster in our lives. It's robbed us. It's stolen from us. It's taken everything. And yet sometimes we're the first ones to go back and to say, well, that was this big, huge thing that was bad. But this is little. This is itty bitty. It's okay. I can fit it in my pocket. Not realizing it's, it's the same breed. It's, a, it's the next generation of that same monster. It's going to grow up the same way. But now it's learned a few things about your tricks. And so now it's going to be twice as ridiculous. The fall is going to be twice as great. The destruction is going to be twice as much. Darkness is not worth it. 
sin is not worth it, something that seems to be misunderstood. Sometimes we think that the longer we've been walking with God, the longer we've been a Christian, the less sinful things should bother us. The less the language in movies should bother us. The less maybe the sex scenes and the perversion in the movie should bother us. The less, you know, going to places in real life, maybe on the internet, where there's things that are inappropriate should bother us. It doesn't work like that. See, the more you look at Jesus, the more holy he gets in your eyes, the more of him you partake of, the more of him you understand, the deeper that revelation of righteousness even goes. And then the longer you've been with the Lord, the authentic sign is that holiness grew. It didn't decrease. Those things bother you more. They don't bother you less. Someone that says, I've been saved 10 years. All the language in these movies don't bother me. What have you been doing the last nine? That's a hardened heart. That's not a soft heart. The more time you spend with Jesus, the softer your heart gets. The closer you get to him. The more you want to look at him. You know, there's an old song. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of this world will look strangely dim, right? Raven Hill used to say, the more I look at Jesus, the more these things grow strangely grim. The more you look at his face, the more you realize th these things are more sinister, they're more evil, they're more wicked than I ever realized that they were. And the less I want anything to do with them. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. All these things will be added to you. What are these things? He, he gives a pretty good explanation of that a few minutes before in the same passage. You know, he talks about clothing, the things that we wear. You know, we, we like to have nice clothes. We like to have nice things. But, you know, nice clothes also cost nice money. And that means we have to go after nice money if we want nice clothes. And if we want nice money, we have to work lots of hours to get the, the money. And then we get the clothes. See, it's not just clothing or no clothing. It's not just food or no food it's we have this desire for all these wonderful amazing things and those desires for the things of this world a world that's going to pass away quickly a world that's going to burn a world that ultimately can offer you nothing of eternal value we chase after those things with all of our hearts you see he says seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and these things will be added to you most of the people i know we seek after all these things we try to add God to that. And is it any wonder our, our nation is in the state that it's in? Our, our families are falling apart. The divorce rate in the church is just as high as it is in the world or higher. Is, is there a reason that maybe like we read this holy Bible right here? And then we look around the church of God nationwide, worldwide. And the things that are happening in here don't seem to be happening in here. The things that are happening in here aren't happening in here. They're not happening in our families. They're not happening on our jobs. They're not happening in our communities. Because we see the things in here that happen when we obey what's written in here. And when we spend time with the one that wrote the things in here. But we don't do that because we're not building his kingdom. We're building our kingdom. And we're trying to use the things that we saw work out of his to bless ours. And he's saying, tear it all down. Will you tear it all down? He's saying, is it enough if it's just me? Because I think when it comes down to it, if 2022 is going to be the year of Jesus, which I think is a very simple thing to do, but I think it's very expensive. I think it's going to cost us everything. I think it's going to cost us a lot of our entertainment. I think it's going to cost us a lot of the useless noise that we listen to and chase after. I think it's going to cost us a lot of the ambition that we have, a lot of the vain dreams and visions for our life that we have that uh, they didn't come from God and, and where they came from is very suspicious at that. But I think Jesus is holding out his hand. And I think he's saying, am I enough? Am I enough? I, I know you want a good job and money for your family. I, I know you want a relationship and you've wanted that for a long time. I, I know you want all those things. But is it enough if it's just me? If, if, is it enough if it's only ever me? And, and I think all of us have to answer that question ourselves. And I don't think anyone can do it for you. In a few minutes, I'm going to close. I'm going to have 
a song play and I'm going to invite you to come forward and just spend some time letting God strip away all the layers of things that have maybe clogged out that pure flame. But I want to tell you one story, if that's all right. There was once, once a rich man and he had a son. The man and his son had a deep, deep love for, for art. He loved Picasso. He loved all the great artists. He loved the Rembrandts. He loved all of them. He loved to go and see the art. He loved to purchase the art. He and his son made it their tradition. It was their hobby. They would go out together and they would, be, they would find the finest art. And because of this incredible wealth that the man had, they would purchase anything that they wanted. And over the years, they had an amazing collection. And as the son got older, into his later teenage years, the father began to notice that he began to handle more of the business dealings. He began to negotiate some of the purchases. And he was so proud of his son. Because his son had just this, this brilliant mind and this ability to uh, you know, be able to handle business. And he was so proud of his son. One day he was going to give his son the entire collection. And then there came a day where war came to this man's country. And the young man, the son, was sent off to fight in this war. And for days on days he, he waited. He would occasionally get a letter from his son about how things were taking place. He looked forward to those letters and then one day no more letters came. And then a short while after that, one last letter came. Saying, we regret to inform you, but your son was killed in the line of duty. And the father's heart was broken. Because the son was all he had. Suddenly he didn't care about the art anymore. He didn't care about all the amazing paintings and the sculptures and all the wonderful things that he collected. He, he missed his son. And then one day there came a knock at the door. And there was a man, he was dressed in army fatigues. He said, sir, your son was in my unit. The night that he died, he saved my life. He, he carried me to safety after I had been wounded. He gave his life for mine. He, he used to tell me and all of the other boys in the unit about this amazing art collection that you and he had together. And how he longed to get home where you guys could begin to go after this again. It was such a special thing to him. And the, the father just shook his head. He began to cry. He was thankful to know that his son had died a hero, but his son was still gone. And then the young man looked at him and he said, Sir, I have a gift for you. You see, I, I'm not a Picasso. I'm, I'm not, I'm maybe not famous, but, but I am an artist of sorts and I, I do paint. And the man pulled out a, a very simple painting. It was a portrait of the man's son. He said, I, I want you to have this. I painted it before he died. And the father took it and he ran inside and he, he put it up on the mantle. And every day he would wake up and he would look and he would see the picture of his son. And he didn't care about any of the other paintings. They all paled in comparison to the picture of his son. It's all he wanted to look at. And then little by little he began to receive mail from other men that his son had served with. Stories of how he had saved their lives. Stories of how he had braved dangerous situations to rescue them. It brought tears of joy. To his face every time he would read the stories he would look at the picture of his son on the mantel place and he would feel a comfort in his heart knowing that his son had been a good man well then one day about six months later the old man passed away he died now because his son was dead and because he wasn't married because there was no next of kin an earthquake began to go through the art world because his family was well known for the art they had amassed and the collection they had. And they knew that because there was no next of kin, there would be an auction. And so museums and uh, people that would like to purchase these great works of art, they were excited. They were so excited to get their hands on some of it because they knew that as they began to purchase it, it would enhance their collection. It would be amazing. So they come to the auction. They come to the auction and they see all of it lined up. It's beautiful. Maybe the most immaculate display of art anyone's ever seen lined up in one place. And the man who's uh, the, the auctioneer, he steps up, he says, we'll begin the bidding. And they're very excited to see what's first. And he brings up a little old picture. It's a little bit worn from a lot of rubbing, a lot of holding, a lot of moving. And it's the picture of the man's son. And he says, the first item we're going to sell today 
is this portrait of the man's son. It is called the son. And he listed the name of the soldier. No one had ever heard of it. And they said, get this out of here. Is this some kind of a joke? We're here for the real art. We're here for the good stuff. We don't want this picture of someone we've never met. And he said, no, 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 I have to do this. This is the first item. The father, before he left, before he died, he said the first thing would be this. This is the first item we have to auction. He said, can I get $100 for it? Just $100. And they looked around and people were angry. They were frustrated. They weren't going to waste time or money on this, this joke. And then there was a little old man in the back of the room. He was holding a broom. He said, all I've got is $10. But I knew that boy. He was precious to me. I want the son. And he brought it up and he exchanged the money and he took the picture. Shouts of applause and cheers came from the crowd as they knew the auction was about to begin. And then they slammed the hammer one more time and they said the auction has been concluded. Startled went through the crowd. They were shocked. What is this? What kind of a joke is this? He said, oh no, 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 no. The father was very clear in the will. He said, first, we're going to give away the son. But you see, whoever gets the son gets it all. And that man who, who didn't have anything to give, all he saw was the picture of the son. He said, I can't afford any of that. I can never have that on my own, but, but give me the picture of the son. That man just inherited more than he could ever imagine. He'll never want for anything the rest of his life. Because whoever gets the son gets it all. Sometimes, in, in the, amen. In the Christian life, we can be so focused on the things that we want God to add to us that we lose sight of God. We're, we're so excited for the blessings. And sometimes we even have this transactional mindset of, I'm going to obey God like that. And because I obey God like that, I know he's going to give me a wife. I know he's going to give me a good husband, a good job. I'm going to get that promotion at work. But it's not about Jesus at that point. That's about, that's about our kingdom. See, if we're going to have a year of Jesus, then every day we need to pull out that picture of the son. We need to look at him and him alone. And there are so many things that become distracting. There are so many things that can take our attention away from the man, Jesus. He's a real person. He has a real mind. He has real emotions. He has real feelings. You don't always feel what he feels. And you don't always think what he thinks or know what's going on inside of his heart. But if you get close to him, he'll share it with you. He'll talk to you. He'll tell you what's going on. He'll give you every plan you need to get through life. He's a real person. But it only comes when we sit and we stare at the sun. And so here's what we're about to do. I'm going to say a prayer. We're going to play some music back there as soon as I pray. And then I'm going to invite you forward. And if you say, yes, I, I want this to be a year. Throw out all the religious games. Throw out the whitewashed tombs. Throw out the cups that are only clean on the outside. Throw out all the secret sin. Throw out all the things that are taking my eyes away from the sun. I don't need any of the other stuff. He can have the stuff. The stuff does nothing for me. My family needs Jesus. My marriage needs Jesus. My destiny needs Jesus. I need Jesus. I'm going to give you an invitation in just a moment after we pray to come. And we're going to get on our face before the Lord. And we're going to spend time there. I don't want that to be a quick thing. I want that to be a personal thing. Some of you guys, you, you come to church and it's awesome. You have one of the best pastors in the region. But he can't do this for you. Nobody can do this for you. You have to decide to get alone with Jesus. And so we get on our faces. We're going to begin to speak to the Lord. You might not know anything to say. Maybe it's been so long since you've had a real conversation with God. Good place to start. I'm sorry. Jesus, I'm sorry, but I'm here. Take me. So we're going to bow our heads. We're going to pray. And then I'm going to invite you forward. And we're going to let him strip it all away. Jesus, we ask you to come. We ask you to move on every heart. May everything that steals our attention away from you, may those things be taken away. May every door in our life that's not you be slammed shut so hard. The only thing we're left with is the door that is you because you are the door. May you probe deep with your Holy Spirit 
and search through the caverns of our soul. May you shine a light and expose before our eyes every secret sin, everything that's held us back, every ounce of darkness, everything we've hidden, everything that nobody knows but you, but the very things that are causing us to see destruction instead of life. May those things be slain on the altar tonight. May you strip away everything that we hide behind every piece of religious armor. May it be torn off so we can be exposed as naked and then be clothed in the robes of your righteousness, Jesus. May you move on our hearts today. Amen. If we can play that song, and I just want to invite you right now to come. Right now to come, because you don't have tomorrow, you don't have this evening, you don't have next year, you don't have the year after, you don't have the week after, you have right now, you have this moment. Right now there's an open door, right now there's an opportunity, right now there's a moment where the Lord is saying, come, 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 right now, come. It doesn't matter who's watching, right now Jesus is watching. And if there's no music, that's okay too. Because he is here and sometimes silence with God is better than all the songs in all the world. Sometimes the silence is very uncomfortable in church today. We like noise because it's easier to hide there. But when it's just you and God, there's nowhere to hide. And you realize you've been running from the wrong person for a very long time. And he's waiting on you to come home. Do whatever you want to Do whatever you want 
that you're asking of us Lord everything that competes with your kingdom Lord everything that competes with a true intimate relationship with Jesus Christ Lord none of these things can satisfy our soul none of these can bring contentment and peace only you can give us that Like Paul said, I count all these other things like dung. I cast them away as worthless, filthy, so that I might gain Christ and that I might know Him. Lord, we lay it down. Lord, every obstacle everything that offends everything that stands between you and me and us to lay it all down at your feet Lord whatever we've experienced this last year the good the bad and the ugly Lord, to lay those things down. To lay them down. And say, Jesus, take it. I don't want it anymore. I don't want this in my life. I don't want this to be the battle that I carry into 2022. I want this to end tonight. I want it to end right now say it's over the battle is over I surrender I surrender I give it all to you Jesus I surrender Lord break the chains Lord break the prison doors and set the captive free once and for all Lord I pray that Lord, if there's any here that would say, I thought I was a Christian. I've tried to convince myself I'm a Christian. But to be honest, I really don't know. I really don't know. Lord, I pray that tonight they will trade in that question mark for an exclamation mark to call upon the name of Jesus that they might be saved to know you and the power of your resurrection. If you're one of those tonight that says, I don't know if I'm really saved, but I want to know. We want to invite you to come. Would you come and just come to the altar right now? We want to pray. We want to pray.
Surrender it all. Lord, tonight, in this place, to leave it all behind, every failure, every doubt, every question mark, and get our eyes fixed upon the prize, to get our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, to get our eyes fixed on eternity. Lord, in the face of eternity, everything else here on this earth grows strangely dim. Jesus, you're all we need. And you've all we've ever needed. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. So let's so all pray this prayer out loud together. God, no more games, no more going through the motions, no more just saying little cute prayers. It's time to do business. It's time to get real. I need you. And I've always needed you. But I know it. And I declare it now. I can't go another day without you. Jesus, I call on your name. I believe that you are the Christ, God's Messiah sent to save me you died on the cross and you rose again from the dead i believe and i believe that if i will call upon your name you will save my soul i call upon you jesus set me free from the power of sin from the penalty of sin and one day from the presence of sin. Jesus, I give you my soul. I give you my life. Now, here, in this place, I am yours and you are mine. Use my life. Fill my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving my soul. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. surrender it tonight I surrender all I surrender all all to thee my blessed Savior I surrender Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, that it's you did all the work. The hardest part is surrender. The hardest part is surrender. But Lord, once we surrender, we realize how foolish we were to put it off any longer. And I pray, Lord, that if there are any of those listening 
God, that have never called upon the name of the Lord, that they might be saved, that tonight would be the night that they would call upon you, that they might be saved. Father, they not go one more minute, Lord, without accepting this great salvation through Jesus Christ. Lord, to die to the old in 2021 and be a new creature entering into 2022. What a wonderful, wonderful reality. So Lord, tonight, I pray that you would do this in their heart and life in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. As we come toward the end of 2021, my time frame here is about four minutes, three to four minutes. Let's just stand and let's let's just enter into this new year with a time of praise. Well, with time of prayer, and then we'll go out with a song. Can Amen. we do that? Amen. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you today once again for this service. We thank you for the time of worship. We thank you for the awesome word. And Lord, we ask you tonight, Lord, just to have your way. Father, as we lay it all down in 2021, Lord, that you will have your way in 2022. Lord, we ask you, Lord, just to come and move, Father, in this church, in this community, in this region, in our state, our nation, and our world. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done in our lives, in our families, in our churches, and Lord, wherever you send us, Lord, let your kingdom come. Let the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ. Lord, move in a mighty way. We thank you for 2021. But Lord, we commit our lives to you in 2022. In Jesus' name. We want to give you an opportunity to give. So I don't know if we have a couple of plates that could be back there at the back. And so anybody that would like to give uh, into Brother John uh, and Hannah's life, uh, they're a blessing. And so if you want to be a blessing to them, I want to tell you this would be great soil. You can write checks out to Grace Fellowship, or if you give cash, whatever goes in the plate tonight uh, will go to be a blessing to them. Brother Dan, lead us in a song, okay? Once again. 